Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Alice Sherwood, who is a writer and the a senior visiting research fellow at King's College in London. Her work uh, concerns uh, cover literary criticism, philosophy, chemistry, business, television documentaries, and uh, Alice will look at Warhol's work through the lens of authenticity, which is actually the title of her first award-winning book, which is in all good bookshops, including the Hugh Lane Bookshop. So, <laughs> Alice. Um, thank you for that, um, and great to be here. Thank you for having me, and what an amazing exhibition. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Warhol uh, and the reinvention of authenticity, uh, which I've called From Artist's Hand to Artist's Brand. And it starts with something that Andy Warhol once said in an interview, uh, when the interviewer was gushing about how much he loved Warhol's work, and Warhol said, well, why don't you talk to Jared Malanga? He did most of my paintings. Uh, so the talk is to explore how a Warhol can be a Warhol, even if Andy never touched it. Uh, I'm going to talk about two very different episodes uh, that I see as key to the shift in what it means for an artwork to count as authentic. And I'm going to learn how to do the slides. Here we go. The first episode is a surprisingly little-known event in the life of uh, Warhol and Jared Malanga, who was one of his most important assistants in the 1960s, and you can see them here. Uh, obviously, Warhol on the left, Malanga on the right in the, t in the white T-shirt, and actually also uh, on that screen over there, uh, which illustrates the transition from an artist's hand notion of authenticity. So a Rembrandt is only authentic if the artist painted it himself, to something much more akin to what we mean by authentic when we talk about branded goods. So you can have a genuine uh, Ralph Lauren polo shirt without actually expecting Ralph Lauren to have made it himself. Uh, and the second episode is the story of the painting on the left, owned by a man called Joe Simon Whelan. Uh, and this painting was an authentic Warhol until one day in February 2002 when it suddenly wasn't uh, because an outfit called the Andy Warhol Authentication Board rather recklessly ruled that it wasn't authentic after all. Uh, this promptly provoked a $7 million lawsuit between the owner of the work and the Authentication Board about what does and doesn't constitute a genuine Warhol. And the interesting thing for us is that it demonstrates that the way that Warhol worked, how he created his art, both subverts and reinvents what we mean by authentic. So, it's 1963. Warhol is transitioning from a successful career in commercial art to one in fine art. And Gerard Malanga, uh, who you can see here on the left, uh, has just started working as his assistant. And Andy is experimenting with screen printing, a process he's imported from the commercial world. And simplifying a lot here, silk screening is basically a sophisticated form of stenciling. So the artist's design is printed onto a transparent acetate, which is then used to create a mesh screen or screens. And paint is pushed through onto the canvas or paper below. Um, and you can see them doing it here. Uh, screen print of Campbell's soup tin. I can't tell you which flavor. Um, if we look closely, uh, maybe we can find it. And Warhol used photographs rather than his drawings for the acetates. And not just any photographs, but powerful, iconic ones. Movie stars, car crashes, electric chairs, famous brand names. Andy would always select the image and get the acetate made and maybe make some changes to it. And Gerard's job was to paint the backgrounds and position the screens over the canvas and push through the different acrylic colors, so say pink for the face, red for the lips, green eyeshadow, and then the final screen to create the characteristic 
often characteristic black outline. And what this gives is a largely mechanical reproduction of a mechanically captured image, photographs, appropriated images, you might say. And this retreat from the canvas suited Warhol very well indeed. He famously said at the time, I want to be a machine. And he even had rubber stamps made of his signature so that other people could sign his pictures for him. Now, this technique meant that they could work very fast indeed. So uh, in that year, Andy and Jerry produced 80 portraits of Liz Taylor, several overlapping images of a gun-toting Elvis death and disaster series, uh, including uh, the orange car crash uh, and suicide, fallen body, and many more. And here you can see Gerard uh, in the studio um, with about a dozen screen printed uh, self-portraits and lots and lots of banana prints. Uh, and this is actually also in a vitrine upstairs, uh, this image uh, in, a, in a glass case. And the point about this slide really is how different this is from our traditional idea of the artist's work, which is the auteur standing in front of a canvas, paintbrush in hand, slowly adding marks. By 1967, Gerard has had enough uh, of factory life. He's fallen in love with a beautiful Italian model and he's decided to follow her to Rome. He's got a one-way ticket, but Andy has promised to send money if Gerard needs it. After about a month in Italy, Gerard runs out of money. He sends a postcard. I'm broke. Have Andy send me money. He promised. No answer from Warhol. So Gerard does on his own what he had done so often with Warhol. He picks out a news photo of Che Guevara after his death in Bolivia, gets acetates and silk screens made, runs off prints on canvas and paper, and pitches them to an Italian gallery owner as genuine Warhols. Gerard writes to Andy and says he presumes this is okay with him. The gallery owner is delighted when the exhibition sells out even before it opens. Then the gallery owner gets wind of the fact that the paintings aren't exactly what they seem to be and informs Gerard that forgery carries a 15 to 20 year sentence in Italy. Gerard sends a panicky telegram begging Andy to endorse the picture, the pictures, and it goes in caps, I will be in an Italian jail without bail. Please help me, please help me, and signs it, peace, Gerard. Finally, Andy breaks his silence and telegraphs the gallery owner to say that the Che Guevara's are originals, but that any money from sales should be sent to him, Andy Warhol. The Malanga paintings have become Warhol's by retrospective authorization. They have become Warhol's because Warhol said they were Warhol's. He wasn't involved in the conception or the making of the works. He didn't author them, but he did authorize them. And this, I feel, is a significant, can be seen as a significant cultural moment, one that marks a shift in a conception of authenticity from an artist's hand to an artist's brand and a post-industrial transformation of the role of creator from author to authorizer. What an artist says about work becomes as important as whether he created it or not. Warhol has brought branding into fine art. Andy has come to realize that a painting can be an original Andy Warhol, whether or not he has ever touched it. From the art market's perspective, this is going to pay havoc with the way they're used to authenticating art. So let's remind ourselves quickly how authentication and therefore valuation in the pre-industrial old master world, where authenticity is very closely linked to price, okay? So here's an example I've written about, and I call her the doubtful princess. So La Principessa, as she came to be known, uh, was bought in 2007 by a man called Peter Silverman, who was convinced it was by Leonardo da Vinci. In the old master world, the artist's hand is the gold standard of authentication. So 
Again, if every mark, every brushstroke on a picture is by Leonardo, and only by Leonardo, then it is an authentic Leonardo da Vinci, which would have made La Principessa worth upwards of $160 million at least. Obviously, Leonardo is not around to authenticate the picture himself. So the next best thing uh, is to go to an expert who can analyze brush strokes, pigments, underpainting, paint handling, canvas, or in this case, vellum, and make a judgment call. And a professor of art history at Oxford did just that and wrote a book saying he believed that it was indeed by Leonardo. Unfortunately, not everyone agreed. Various museums refused to put the picture in their Leonardo exhibitions. The auction house Christie's, who had sold this picture, the same picture four years previously, as 19th century German painting in the Renaissance style, and not for $100 million, uh, dollars, but for $22,000, absolutely refused to change their opinion. And to add insult to injury, a famous forger, Sean Greenhalgh, claimed he had drawn the girl in the portrait, <laughs> basing her features on a snotty girl he knew called Sally who'd worked down the co-op in Bolton. <laughs> Which, if true, would have made the picture worth next to nothing. The classical scale of authenticity, which is very closely tied to market value, is all about the artist being there at the moment of creation and it being literally their handiwork. Leonardo present with paintbrush in hand, it's worth 160 million. Same picture, but no Leonardo, worth virtually nothing. Here is Joe Simon's picture. And you can see immediately why that traditional authentication scale doesn't work. It's a self-portrait, uh, Warhol self-portrait, you can see from a photo booth picture. And it's from a 1965 series of 10 called the Red Series uh, after the color of their backgrounds. There's no point looking for Warhol's brushwork uh, here, because he didn't do any brush strokes here. It's a screen print. Uh, you can't look for any sign of the artist's hand, uh, because screen prints were probably made by an assistant, or specifically in the case of this work, not, <clears throat> not even screen printed in Andy's studio, but sent off site to a printer with a list of Warhol's instructions. A hands-off technique, which was a significant departure from Warhol's technique at that time, in the mid-60s, uh, but one he used a lot more later. So all very congruent with how Warhol liked to work, but to a confused authentication board who were working on, we presume, the old artist's hand scale, uh, completely baffling. How do you value that? What the board was trying to do was to restrict real Warhols to ones where Andy was present as the work was being made, when Andy's point was precisely that he was trying not to be there. They wanted uniqueness where Andy made multiples, and they were looking for artists' hand from the emperor of brand. So what did they do? Rather than explore how the meaning of authenticity might have shifted, they simply stamped denied, denied, twice, in fact, they did it over time, all over the back of Joe Simon's picture, rendering a $2 million painting virtually worthless. Uh, by the way, if you are interested in this story, uh, which is even more extraordinary than I have time to tell you here, I do recommend Richard Dorman's book on it, which is called Warhol After Warhol. The authentication board uh, did the same to another picture uh, from the same series, the 1965 series. Uh, this one, Andy had signed with his own hand, dated and inscribed to his long-term business partner, uh, Bischof Berger, and chosen it as the cover of his catalogue resume, which you can see here. Something uh, he'd be very unlikely to do if he didn't regard it as his own work. And the board denied it with a judgment that I think counts as one of the most surreal in the history of art authentication. And it goes as follows. 
It is the opinion of the Authentication Board that the said work is not the work of Andy Warhol, but that the said work was signed, dedicated, and dated by him. And again, a picture, notionally at least, rendered virtually worthless. But of course, these pictures are not worthless. We know that. The top price paid for a Warhol is the staggering $195 million paid in 2022 for Shots Age Blue Marilyn, uh, 1964 work at Christie's New York, which also made it the most expensive piece of 20, 20th century art ever sold. Uh, an art broker uh, tells us that the average value of Warhol artworks has experienced a 24 compound annual growth rate over the last five years. So, in the absence of the artist's hand, what is it that makes Warhols so valuable? It can't be, or as judged by price, it can't be that other classic determina uh, determinant of value, scarcity. Um, in standard economics, uh, the scarcer something is, the more valuable it is. So Leonardo's are scarce. There are fewer than 20 paintings that we know of. Drawings number in the low hundreds. Vermeer's are scarce. So last year's show in Amsterdam uh, had 28 works. But Warhol's? Uh, when Warhol died, he left about 4,000 paintings, 5,000 drawings, approximately 19,000 prints. He's not scarce at all. So why the staggering prices? And a big part of the answer is that we now live in an attention economy. So it's one where the more attention something gets, the more valuable it is. So if you think about social media, uh, whether platforms or influencers, the more clicks they get, the more we think they're worth. We don't just pay attention to what we value, we value what we pay attention to. And Warhol is a world-class attention getter. Uh, which is not to suggest that his work doesn't also repay contemplation. Uh, it does. But Warhol's pictures are almost unique in how they globalise and cross cultures because they are so easy to get. As the art critic Robert Hughes explained in The Shock of the New in 1980, our uniquely congested culture has changed how we consume art. An old master painting has layers of meaning that unfold as you look and relook at the world. And it belongs to a world of few distractions and a slow time of singular objects and the, le and the leisure with which to study them. If you strip an image of its complexity, says Hughes, what you get is a sign like a poster or an icon with a single meaning. I'm not sure about the single meaning, but with an overriding meaning. Signs that are universal, easily digested, and rapidly understood. And Warhol's pictures are perfect for art's new habitat, which is, as Hughes put it, a forest of media. In this world, art buyers are cash rich, but time poor. They have lots of dollars to spare, but very little mind space. So if you can establish something as a must have, you've bagged the scarcest resort, resource of all, which is their attention. So how would you go about bagging that attention? Well, you would make, sure, you would make art that is stunning, captivating, attention-getting, and you would make sure that it's everywhere, ubiquitous. And Warhol's art is certainly, certainly captivates. Death, disaster, race riots, movie stars, icons, the color, the scale, the repetitive imagery, the shocking imagery. Uh, here's the orange car crash um, at the Whitney. These are destabilizing and they are attention grabbing. And then there's ubiquity. While he was alive, Warhol was everywhere. Partly because he was a genuinely, he was genuinely ahead of his time in being a multimedia artist. And uh, we can see this uh, all around us. Uh, there were his pictures, his films, his videos, his music, uh, his installations, uh, the wonderful silver clouds uh, reproduced in the first space of this exhibition. Um, and partly because, of course, the instantly recognizable 
persona he created for himself. And if anything, he's even more ubiquitous now. Ubiquitous and, uh, uh, as we know, uh, still very relevant. Since Andy's death, the foundation has ensured that Warhol has become the most exhibited artist in the world. It set up the Andy Warhol Museum in 94, endowing it with nearly 4,000 iconic Warhol works, as well as archival material. It's also donated 50,000 works, over 50,000 works to 300 institutions um, worldwide. The museum lends works from its collections uh, to museums and galleries around the world and uh, says that exhibitions organized or co-organized or with donations by the Warhol Museum have been seen by over 9 million people in 36 countries. Uh, in attention markets, quantity of attention counts for more than quality because there is a limited amount of attention to go around. And Andy Warhol is an attention magnet. Uh, I gather that when Andy Warhol, three times out, uh, opened in October last year, it attracted 40% more visitors than the previous record number. The saturation bombing of our collective consciousness has made Warhol more than an artist. Warhol is a commercial titan. He may have died in 1987, but he lives on in collabs, as you can see here with uh, Estee Lauder uh, for perfume, uh, who are using uh, the flower images, uh, some of which you obviously can also see upstairs. Uh, collabs with Kid Robot for children's toys, with Levi's and Converse for clothes and shoes, with Philip Tracy for hats, with Seiko for watches, with Burton for snowboards, and you'll be glad to hear with Campbell's Soup for soup. <laughs> the afterlife of Warhol is every bit as inescapable as the man himself. Uh, I don't know, have, have any of you seen that? There's a Netflix series of his diaries, which is partly narrated by a Warhol-like voice, which is actually an AI program reading the stories the artist told Pat Hackett. And the AI-generated voice sounds very flat and very robotic, so quite like Warhol. You can download a similar program, which will read out any text you type in, again, in a Warhol-like voice. And there are any amount of so-called Warholizers on the internet that will create Warhol-style images, really not very good ones, from whatever photos you upload. And just to ensure that no day need pass without Warhol, the Warhol Museum runs a live stream feed from his grave site 24-7. Authenticity, which was our guide and gold standard for value, has been, re been replaced by a number of things, uh, uh, including, and I think importantly, by attention and by ubiquity. We're just beginning to work this out. As with so many other things, we're only just catching up with Warhol. Thank you. <laughs>